Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's devotional. Today, we're going to be discussing Mark chapter 15. And why don't we dive right into it? We're so glad that you're joining us today. Um, we're picking up right where we left off. And in today's chapter, we're going to see the final hours of Jesus' life here on this earth before he goes to the cross. There's so many important elements and moments that lead up to this the crucifixion of Jesus, and we're going to talk about these things. So we've broken up today's chapter in six different pieces, and so let's start from the top. Chapter 15, verse 1. I title this section, Jesus Doesn't Fight His Case. This is interesting, and we'll talk about why that's so important. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. So not this time, the Jewish leaders, they hand Jesus over to Pilate. He's a Roman governor. And they intentionally bring him to Pilate because the Jewish leaders technically couldn't sentence Jesus to death, but they wanted, some, they wanted Jesus to die. And so they gave him to Pilate. And Pilate had the authority to, or the power to sentence someone to be crucified. So it says, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, you have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many other crimes. So Pilate probably would not have sentenced Jesus to the cross to be sentenced to be crucified for claiming to be maybe God or some other things. He probably just would have thrown the case to the side. But because Jesus affirmed that he is the king of the Jews, that he is king, then that was for Pilate a reasonable <laughs> reason to send somebody to be crucified. So this was a legitimate offense according to the Roman government. Now keep, stay with me here. We're, we're getting into some details here, but some really important elements that we're going to be talking about. So Jesus affirms he is king. And, but in this moment, we can see that the leading priests kept accusing him of other things. All the religious leaders, they were throwing out, I'm sure, all sorts of things. He did this. He does that. He does this. And Pilate asked him, are you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Well, it's interesting that Jesus here doesn't fight his case. All these accusations that they're making against Jesus, I'm sure, are false. He says to do this. He's a revolutionary. He's a rebel. He wants to overthrow the government. I mean, some of these things probably aren't true, and they're accusing him of crimes and that are punishable by death. The reality is that Jesus is an innocent man being sentenced to death. Jesus has no sin in him, no fault no blemish. There's nothing that Jesus has done wrong. Yet he's not fighting his case. If anybody could fight their case, it was Jesus. If anyone could stand there and defend himself and say, I didn't do any of this, it was Jesus. Yet he held his tongue and, in, and he didn't fight his case. But this is so important to understand. The reason why Jesus didn't fight his case is because he wasn't paying for his crimes or his own debt, he was paying for ours. Jesus was paying the debt and the crimes that we owed. Pilate didn't understand that. The religious leaders couldn't see that. But Jesus saw the bigger picture here. He was taking upon himself the crimes and the debts and the sin that you and I have committed. He was paying for our debt. So he didn't fight his case because he wasn't fighting his case. He wasn't facing his trial after all. This was our trial. Jesus was going through the punishment that you and I deserved. So there was no case to fight because Jesus was paying our debt. I thank God that he did this. Thank God that Jesus powered through and with all the endurance and strength and power that he had in his earthly body. He endured this pain, these false accusations, this betrayal for you and I so that we can be forgiven of our sin. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. So now we go and we see beginning um, verse 6. This is the next section. And I title this section, Jesus is traded for a murderer. Look at verse 6. It goes on to say, Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. Okay, this was just a tradition, something that Pilate did during Passover. He would release a prisoner. Now it happened to be Passover, so it was time to release somebody. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas. He was a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. So this was a real criminal, real criminal. He was a murderer. He hurt people. He was a revolutionary. He was a dangerous man. If there was someone that they needed to crucify or to, or to lock up, it was a guy like Barabbas. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. So Pilate asked, he says, would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? He's speaking about Jesus. For he realized that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. So Pilate could kind of already see. It's like these religious leaders, they're, they're doing something here that's a little suspicious. But at this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Wow. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Crucify him. The crowd was stirred up and shouting, crucify Jesus. Why, Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? And again, Pilate couldn't, couldn't really see that there is there was much of a case here. You know, in, in, other, in another gospel, he could see that even his wife is like, have nothing to do with this man. He's a righteous man. They can see that Jesus had done nothing wrong. But the crowd was stirring up so much. And there was so much demand for Jesus to be crucified. So to pacify the crowd, or in other words, to make the crowd go a little at ease, Pilate released Barabbas to them and he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead tip whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Jesus is traded for a murderer. He's traded for a murderer. He's a convicted murderer, Barabbas. There's no denying he committed his crimes and is totally released from paying his own penalty and traded for Jesus an innocent man who owes no debt. This is important for us because the same happened for us. We are the criminals. We are those rebels. We are the murderers. Yet Jesus stepped into our place and traded places with us so that he could pay the price and we could be free. In this story, in this section, we are Barabbas. We're the sinners. We're the ones that should be locked up. We're the ones that should pay that price. Yet it was Jesus that was sentenced to crucifixion in our place. Thank you, Jesus, again. Thank you, Jesus, that you would step into our place. And we were the ones that should have paid that price, but you did for us, Jesus. Thank you so much. So Pilate sets Barabbas free and and hands Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to be flogged and to be crucified. So now it leads to the next section here. Jesus is mocked, starting from verse 16. It says, The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe. Purple represents royalty, and they were mocking him here. And they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head to represent a crown or, uh, or what, what at that time they would wear, uh, royalty would wear a crown on their head. But they were mocking him. And then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with the reed stick, spit on him, dropped to their knees in mock worship. The scripture calls it in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, 
They took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. So they dressed him in all these elaborate things to mock him in the purple robe and the crown of thorns. And to be honest, we may look at this story and a lot of us feel the same way. We look at these Roman soldiers and we think to ourselves, how evil, how evil could they be to, to hit, to spit on, to pull the beard of an innocent man of our Jesus. And we think these things and we feel this way, but I want to put this into perspective here and remember that in this story, again, we are those soldiers. We are the ones that have put Jesus through this. And a lot of us, many times, if we're not careful, we have mocked Jesus. We've mocked God with our lifestyle. Well, scripture goes on to say, you cannot mock the justice of God. What we sow, we will reap. And many of us, at times, we try to mock we give God a mock worship, which is a, a fake worship because we, we, we want to honor God maybe on, on a Sunday, but our lifestyle dishonors him. So we should ask ourselves this, is my lifestyle dishonoring to God? Am I mocking God by my lifestyle? Am I pretending to worship him on Sundays, am I pretending to worship God like these soldiers did? They were pretending. They gave a mock worship. They got on their knees. They hailed Jesus. They said the right things. They crowned him as Lord. And they did all the, the steps. But this was a mock worship because they really were dishonoring God. Let's instead choose to live lives that are full of repentance, full of humility, and pleasing to God. And this requires some self-reflection and some self-evaluation. I pray that in this devotional, not even just now, but even as we read this chapter, we can reflect in our heart and really ask ourselves, God, how can I honor you with my lifestyle and truly worship you in everything that I do? So Jesus goes on. He's mocked by the, by the Roman soldiers. And then we get into the fourth section here. Jesus is crucified. Starting from verse 21. A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. So this is like a stranger. This is somebody who was probably visiting the town during Passover celebration, probably from far, far away. He had no real connection or association to who Jesus was, I'm sure. And um, he, you know, he was just somebody. So they asked this stranger, they said, hey, we need you to help Jesus carry this cross. Because it was heavy, Jesus was exhausted. Typically, they make the criminals carry the cross to the place of crucifixion, but Jesus was so exhausted, he was already flogged and whipped on his back and beaten and mocked, and so they needed some, he needed some help. And it says, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. So this moment we can see that this man named Simon comes and helps Jesus. Now this, this may be an important part, maybe not, but this is what I took from this. And this is really key that another Simon steps in the place for Simon Peter. Remember Jesus disciples name. One of his disciples is Simon Peter. And another man, Simon, comes in and steps in place. Now, remember what Simon Peter said. He said, I will go to death with you if that's what needed. I will never betray you. But Jesus tells him, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. And, you know, Peter denies it, says, no, I'll go with you to death. So Simon Peter really should have been here carrying the cross with Jesus. But another Simon steps into place. You know, I think it's important for us to know that God has called us to carry our cross, to follow Jesus, to walk with him. So let's not lose our place with the Lord. Let's stay aligned with where God has called us to be. And like this Simon stepped in for another Simon, don't let a Simon stand in your place. God has called you with a plan and a purpose. God has given you a calling. You know, uh, God is giving you a mission on this earth. And you have time now to step into that. 
Don't let someone else step into what God has called you to do. He's created you for a reason with unique gifts. No one else can fill the shoes that you have and do what you've, no one else has your testimony or your story. Use what God has given you to live for him and to bring him glory and to see others come to know Christ. Amen. Let's do that together. So then we go and we could see moving forward in verse 24. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. So they nailed Jesus to the cross. And this is a very excruciating pain. As a matter of fact, this word excruciating literally comes from, uh, it's a word that um, comes from the Roman word, which means out of the cross. Its word was invented to describe the kind of pain that a crucifixion would cause somebody. This is how much pain Jesus had to endure. So he's nailed to the cross. And at this time, people begin to see him publicly because it's nine in the morning. Remember, this is really early in the morning. So now he's on the cross by around nine in the morning. They nail him to the cross. They continue to mock him. And they say things like this in verse 29 says, the people passing by shouted. They say these things. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then save yourself and come down from the cross. They said, you said you were going to do these things. You said you were going to destroy the temple. Look at you now. But I want to say this to you and to all of us. Don't worry because Jesus will do everything he said he will do. They just didn't understand how how it could happen or when it would happen or in what way to their minds, they had no understanding of how that would take place. But Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about and he will and is doing everything he said he will do. Here's a note for us. Let's not lose hope in what Jesus says will happen. Everything he says will come to pass. The people didn't understand what he meant. And so what did they do? They choose not to believe him. But for us, we could react the same way at times. There's times we may not fully understand how God is going to do something. Maybe he's giving you a promise or a word to stand on. And it's hard for you to continue to trust in that promise. Well, I want to encourage you. Jesus will do everything he said he's going to do. You can trust him. So rather than fall into doubt rather than resort to doubt instead let's stand on faith rather than respond with doubt and saying God you said you were going to do this and maybe it doesn't pan out the way you thought it would or maybe you it, the way you pictured it in your mind of happening maybe it's not happening in that way doesn't mean God will not fulfill his promises just means he has a better way and instead of going into doubt and disbelief and turning from God Let's lean in on faith in God's promises. Let's trust that God will do everything he says he will do. The, we read earlier in Mark that Jesus says this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. There's one thing we can count on. It's the word of Jesus. It's the word of God. We could stand on it for eternity and it will never pass away. You can trust a word from God. So I want to encourage you, if you've lost hope or 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 faith in God's word, pray right now and ask the Lord to stir your faith in the promises that he's giving you. And let's lean on God again. He, Jesus will do what he said he'll do. Let's keep going forward. We got a few more verses here. Now we can see the next section, Jesus dies. Jesus dies. We can see, start from verse tw uh, 33. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. <laughs> Which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood. They thought he was crying out for Elijah. Um, which in that uh, Eloi and Elijah's probably sounded similar at that time. This is so amazing that Jesus, Jesus here cries out to God and says, God, why have you abandoned me? 
Just imagine that for all of eternity past, for all of time, since before anything in this world was ever created, Jesus, the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit, had always been together. And it wasn't until this moment right here that they were separated. This is the moment that Jesus became sin for us. And he experienced for the first time ever separation from God. And I could imagine all the pain he endured. Of course, we know he endured excruciating pain, which was nails driven through his wrist. His body was, was dealing with so much pain and, and even the posture of crucifixion made it painful to just breathe. You had to put your weight on, uh, you had to pull up to get one breath. You had to pull up to get one breath, but every time he did that, the nails that were in his feet would experience excruciating pain. He had to push off of the nails that were piercing his feet. His back would rub against the rugged cross. All that pain he endured, the pain of betrayal, the pain of experiencing sin, but one pain I think we, it's hard for us to understand is that Jesus, for the first time ever, felt separation. From God the Father. And this was the full wrath of God being poured out upon Jesus for us because God loves us that much. So he cries out, my God, why have you abandoned me? And then it goes on to say that Jesus, verse 37, uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. He breathes his last breath, and the curtain was torn. And in another gospel, we can see that he uttered the words, it is finished. And the words, it is finished, comes from the Greek word, tetelestai, which also means paid in full. Jesus, in that moment, uttered a cry, all of sin, all the debt, for the price of for the sin that we've committed, the price has now been paid in full. Thank you, Jesus. All the sin that we've caused, all the sin that we've willingly stepped into was paid in full in this moment. Thank you, Lord. And then in that moment, God tore the veil from top to bottom. That was the curtain that was in the temple was torn from top to bottom. This shows that the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient to pay for the sin in full. We would now have right standing with the Father and access to his presence. And it's interesting, it's important to note that that curtain was not torn from bottom to top, but that curtain was torn from top to bottom. It was torn from heaven by God, not from the bottom by man. God said, the veil is torn, the price is paid. Now men can have right standing, men and women can have right standing with me. They can stand in my presence as righteous, declared righteous because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross. Thank you, Lord. And then we go to our last section here. Jesus is buried. Verse 42, all this happened on a Friday on Good Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, as evening approached, Jesus of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now, Jesus takes this risk and he asked Pilate if they can bury Jesus. And this is a risk because it, it was, it was, it really was customary. It was part of the policy for a criminal on a cross to die and to rot there for days. And even at times they allowed animals to feast on the body. And it was also very unusual for the Roman government to allow family or somebody to take the body and to bury it because they wanted to this crucifixion to be a symbol, not to uh, rebel against the government and whatnot. And it was also a risk because Jesus, I'm sorry, Joseph was an honored 
member of the high council, which meant that he could get serious ridicule or pushback for honoring Jesus in this way. But Joseph didn't care about any of this. He got permission to get the body of Jesus. They brought him down. They confirmed that Jesus was dead. They wrapped him in a linen cloth. They took Jesus' body down from the cross, laid him in a tomb that Joseph had already prepared. And then a stone was rolled in front of the entrance. You know, Joseph was not ashamed to honor Jesus, even if that means he would have received ridicule. And in the same way, we should not be ashamed of the gospel. We should not be ashamed of what Jesus has done for you and I. Let's not be ashamed to honor Jesus in our lives, in our words, in our conversations around others who may give you pushback or ridicule you. Let's honor God in the way we live. Let's honor him in our words. Let's honor him in our decisions. In this moment, Jesus dies and laid in the tomb and the stone was rolled in front of the entrance of the tomb. Now we know what's going to happen later, but in this moment, it seems like there's no hope. Jesus is dead and he's in the tomb. But we know that later Jesus will resurrect. He will be alive again and officially conquer sin and death for you and I. Thank you, Lord. I pray that today's devotional has given you some encouragement, but also given you a deeper understanding of what Jesus did for you and I. And that it would give us some more reverence, appreciation, a fear of the Lord to help us love God for all that he's done for us. I'd like to pray for you in this moment. God, I pray for everybody that's watching right now, God, that you would touch them and they would feel your presence in a new way. Jesus, we thank you for what you did on the cross for us. You paid such a high price. You stepped into our place. You paid for our debt. You owed no debt. You owed no, owed no sin. Yet you willingly went through all of this so that we can be forgiven and free. Jesus, thank you. We repent right now. We humbly ask for forgiveness of our sins. And we come and we turn our life to you. We devote our lives to you in this moment. Thank you, God, for saving us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching today's devotional. Let's dive into the scripture for ourselves. Let's write down in our growth books. Let's get some insight for what God has for us. And I believe that we're going to grow this week like we never have before. We love you. God bless you. And have a wonderful day. Um.